these three pills that I'm about to take are what are keeping me alive. This is Intellance, and this is Truvada. Excuse me while I take them. I might choke, so I apologize if I do. Yeah, anyone want one? <laughs> These ones are really chalky, so they break down in your mouth. And Mmm, smooth. Every day, I have to take those pills. I started that about five months ago. And, uh, well, I hear lots of people talk about living with HIV is no big deal because you just take a pill and everything's okay. I just proved to you, one, it's not a pill. It depends on which regime you're on. Um, in this case, I'm on Intellens and Truvada. It's three pills, once a day. But it has lots of side effects. Uh, I vomit a lot. Um, I like to joke that my uh, asshole has become a faucet of shit, um, which I take lots of drugs to control that as well. Um, and I get headaches on a regular basis, and I'm fatigued on a regular basis. Uh, in about an hour and a half, I will start to zone out because these drugs will make me so tired. That's what living with HIV and taking these drugs is about. Um, as we said, I've been HIV positive since 2007. The person who infected me knew that he was HIV positive at the time that we had sex, and he did not disclose. Um, at the time, when I told people that I'd become infected, everybody was like, you should send him to jail for that. And I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We both chose to have sex. There was a mutual decision there. There was a consent there. Why should he go to prison for four years? Because of consensual behavior. That sort of started me down the path of exploring HIV policy in Michigan and across the United States. The presentation that I'm going to zip through very quickly tonight is a result of four years of that kind of investigative work. Um, <coughs> so there's my basic information. Um, most important is uh, the Bloggers and Journalists Guide to Reporting on the HIV Epidemic. That should be coming out January 1st at the Center for HIV Law and Policy. It will be the first comprehensive guide for reporters and bloggers in the history of the epidemic. So for 30 years, we've not had a comprehensive way to report about HIV, let alone ethical considerations. Right now, when somebody's charged with an HIV-related crime, they're outed as HIV positive, but the person who chose to have sex with them is not identified. One, we already know of at least one case where a person was charged under the HIV specific criminal statute in Florida, and it turned out he wasn't even HIV positive. And yet he's now living with the stigma of being HIV positive when he's not, because the police identified him as HIV positive. So this guidance will actually encourage reporters to either identify both, pe both people in such a case or neither. And it's preferable that it's neither until you prove in a court of law that the person was HIV positive. So criminalization, let's talk about this a little bit. There are, there are two kinds of criminalization that we see in the United States. First is the HIV specific law. Michigan has an HIV specific law. We also have traditional law, murder, bioterrorism, attempted murder, assault with a deadly weapon, all of those lovely charges. Those are what we call the general laws and can be applied to people living with HIV. We also see that HIV can be used as a determination to increase sentencing for people living with HIV who've committed another crime. Uh, in one case, a gentleman was charged with felonious assault for spitting at a police officer in a Michigan prison, and uh, because he was HIV positive and the cops had beaten him until he was bleeding and there was blood in his, in his saliva, they actually upped his, his conviction points because he'd used a deadly weapon, which was his HIV positive blood. He was also hepatitis B positive, which was more likely to be transmitted, but that did not figure into the charging for a deadly weapon, which was one of the things that we see across the United States is that we criminalize HIV, but other viruses that are much easier to, to transmit, much easier to get, and much more deadly are not criminalized. For instance, hepatitis uh, B and C not a crime to have sex and not disclose your status with those in the state of Michigan. Uh, HPV, not a crime to have that and not disclose it. All those cause cancer. 
Um, in fact, H HPV has been linked to cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, throat cancer, and uh, mouth cancer, and is far more deadly than the HIV epidemic. Yet, there's nothing out there about that. Um, right now, there are 34 states in the U.S. and two territories that have HIV-specific criminal laws. Although, interestingly, in Florida, the law only applies to heterosexuals because they use the term sexual intercourse. And the only place that the federal or that the state courts could figure the definition of sexual intercourse from was in the uh, incest statute in Florida, which defines sex between a male and a female. So, therefore. Same-sex sexual behavior and not disclosing in Florida is not a crime. So finally, at some point, the heterosexuals get to feel what homosexuals have felt for years. <coughs> this is Michigan's penetration law. <clears throat> Basically, what it says is that as an HIV-positive person, I have to tell you that I'm HIV-positive before we have any type of sexual intercourse at all, however slight. And I think that's really important to remember. Here's the other part that is really important to remember. Sexual penetration means sexual intercourse, cunnilingus, fellatio, anal intercourse, or any other intrusion, however slight, of any part of a person's body or of any object into the genital or anal openings of another person's body, but emission of semen is not required. So what does that mean? Well, it means here in Michigan, I can share a needle with somebody and not tell them that I'm HIV positive. However, if after we've gotten high on whatever we were shooting up, we think it would be really funny for me to perform fellatio on a dildo before I may allow that dildo to penetrate my mouth, however slight. I must first disclose that I'm HIV positive or I've committed a four-year felony in the state of Michigan. Which one is more likely to spread the virus? The needle sharing or me pervo per performing oral sex on a sex toy? That's the reality of what we're dealing with with this epidemic. The other thing that we deal with here in Michigan is called health threat to others. And this is part of the Michigan Public Health Code Act. It was passed as part of the smallpox uh, epidemic and eradication programs, uh, going as far back as when Michigan was a territory. And it was designed to give the government the authority to force people to get vaccinated for smallpox. It was then applied to the tuberculosis epidemics, and it's now being used on a real regular basis for people living with HIV. It is not being used at this time for any other disease in the state of Michigan which is really important to remember because we have multiple resistance staph infections that are going around that are dangerous because you can't address them with antibiotics. There are lots of other diseases that are going around in the state that we are not applying health threat to others to, only to HIV. And we're gonna talk a little later on about how that's being used, a little bit about where all these laws came from. Uh, we need to remember that HIV has only been here for 30 years. June 5th, 1981 is the first time that the epidemic was described. And you'll notice that two out of five people who were reported in this original report were already dead. For the discovery of a new disease, that's a terrifying piece of information. And that was the way we were introduced to the AIDS epidemic. It took until about May 1983 for the French to discover the virus, and they called it the lymphadenectomy-associated virus, LAV. And because in science you double-check your work and you have other people peer review it, so they sent that virus to Dr. Robert Gallo at the National Institutes of Health, and suddenly Dr. Robert Gallo announced, I've discovered the virus, it's an HTLV-3, it's part of a new class of, drug, of uh, viruses that I've discovered, and many years later, when a genetic sequence was done of the LAV virus from the French and the HTLV3 virus from Gallo, they were literally the same virus. Gallo stole the virus. However, for years, there was a fight between the French and the Americans about who actually discovered the virus, and as a result, it withheld the licensing process, and it wasn't until 1985 that we got a license to do the blood testing. And that's when testing for HIV antibodies was started. And it started in blood banks first and then moved into human subjects. So it's only been about 25 years that we've been testing for the virus. But even testing for the virus, we didn't know what it meant. You know, how many people were going to be positive and not develop disease? How many people were going to be positive and develop disease quickly? What was the gestation period? During this time, we saw a huge amount of fear. This was the first time in modern America that we saw the 
a disease that was killing people that was contagious. And we didn't really know how to deal with it in America. So what we started doing is we started seeing, uh, as I saw seen here, law enforcement was demanding extra protections. In San Francisco, they were given multiple thick layers of gloves. They were given face masks to do mouth to mouth. They were given masks to handle protesters. Um, we saw funeral homes refusing to accept the bodies of people who died of AIDS. We saw funeral homes dumping those bodies in the alleyways. We saw all kinds of things like that. And we also saw uh, people who were perceived to be at risk, mostly gay men, mostly effeminate gay men, fired from jobs, particularly in the service industry, because the fear was that they were going to spread this virus through casual contact. It was a terrifying time in America, and that time translates into a lot of what we see today, and it's still underpinning it. We also saw at that time this meme. Early on in the epidemic, gay people deserved it because they were hedonists and they were having horrible sex, and see, this is God coming back on you. But then we started seeing babies getting the virus, and we started seeing the elderly getting the virus from blood transfusions, and then we started seeing hemophiliacs, and that's when we got this innocent victim meme, where suddenly, there were people who deserved it and people who were accidental, who were victims, who, who didn't deserve it. And as a result, they played off of each other, which allowed a lot of social conservatives to avoid discussing the real epidemic and the real problems of the epidemic, which was the fact that we were not providing medical care, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for people living with and dying from this brand new epidemic. Um, two of the most notable cases are Ryan White, which I'm sure you've all heard of. He was a uh, young man who was uh, prohibited from attending a school uh, in Indiana because he was HIV positive. His home was burnt down over it. Um, and then he died in 1990 from AIDS. And then the other one was Kimberly Bergalis, who was infected by uh, Dr. David Acer in Florida, who was himself HIV positive, and Dr. Acer allegedly uh, filled syringes with his own blood and injected a bunch of his patients and infected them with the virus. That has never been completely proven, so we don't know for a fact, but it appears that that was the evidence. And for certain, that was how it was played in the U.S. Senate when Senator Jesse Helms brought Kimberly Bergalis to testify about being a victim to the, ten to the Senate. Good old Ronald Reagan. That's the best picture I could find of him. <laughs> um, Reagan took six years to give a policy speech on the AIDS epidemic. He mentioned it twice before that, one of which was even in a State of the uh, Union speech. So it's not true that he didn't utter the word AIDS until 1987, but he did not give a policy speech until 1987. You have a brand new epidemic that's literally killing healthy young men, and the President of the United States said nothing for six years. You can imagine why people were upset. The reason why is because he had advisors like Jerry Falwell saying AIDS is the wrath of God upon homosexuals, or Pat Buchanan who said the poor homosexuals, they've declared war upon nature and now nature is extracting an awful retribution. Buchanan, when he wrote that, was actually advising Ronald Reagan. One of his other advisors was a guy named Bauer, who now runs one of the family associations. And he is the reason that it took over a year for this man, the Surgeon General of the United States, to be able to send out the first ever mailing about the AIDS epidemic. Gary Bauer fought tooth and nail to prevent explicit information being con included in that pamphlet about how HIV was and was not spread because they didn't want to offend middle America by talking about sex. As a result, we finally got Coop's message, but it was a little too late and not a whole lot of information. It did provide some basic information like you can't get HIV from mosquitoes and you can't get it from casual contact. The problem is, is that it didn't really explain how you could get HIV. So the concept of toxic HIV continued to build because people were so dying. I bring this up because I think it's important to to have an understanding of government spending in this time period. 1977, which was the, the last infectious disease that was discovered, was Legionnaire's disease. There were 29 deaths associated with that. And in the 18 months that it took to do the investigation to discover Legionella uh, bacteria, 
the U.S. government said spent $34,381 per death. The AIDS epidemic, in the first year, we spent $3,225 per death and $8,991 in 1982. There were 260 people dead by the end of 1992. That right there is evidence that this government did not take this epidemic as seriously. Legionnaires were good old military folks, and this was queer folks. That's why the spending was so bad. Um, it's important when we talk about this that in 1983, a group of HIV positive people and people living with AIDS got together and said, we need to sort of create this ethical framework about what it is to be living with this disease. And one of the things that they said was, we have a responsibility to substitute low, set, low risk sexual behaviors for those which could endanger themselves or their partners. We feel people with AIDS have an ethical responsibility to inform their potential sexual partners of their health status. I want to emphasize this word right here, ethical. There is an ethical responsibility to disclose an HIV positive status. There is not a criminal responsibility. But, you know, government being government, went ahead and did it anyway. Uh, the first report on the HIV epidemic was in 1987, commissioned in 87, came out in 88, and it recommended that the responsibility of those who are HIV infected not to infect others. As part of that recommendation, the Watkins report said that people sh there should be criminal sanctions for people living with HIV who do not disclose their status. They went so far as to even make it a very clear point in regards to sexual transmission. They were obsessed with sex. They didn't talk about needles, which is kind of interesting because at that point we knew that heroin use was one of the main drivers of the epidemic at that point, particularly as it was beginning to break into the heterosexual community as it was. So from this, we then see the development of these HIV-specific criminal statutes. In fact, right after this came out, the Michigan Senate and House adopted Michigan's HIV disclosure law based on the Watkins report. In 1990, we passed the Ryan White Care Act, and that was signed by George Bush Sr., and it provided really important and needed money to deal with the epidemic in terms of medications and treatment and care and all that fun stuff. But it also had this lovely deadly pill in it that required all 50 states to certify that they had a way to criminally sanction anybody who did not disclose their HIV status. By 2000, everybody had said, yep, we have one. Uh, interesting here is if you look at the rates of death, HIV went way up until 1994, but this doesn't show the advent of 1996 and what we call the Lazarus effect. Here's a better picture. You'll notice that suddenly in 1995, and actually didn't become widely available until 96, we saw this huge decline and new infections and people dying from AIDS. And that was the medications, just like those. The protease inhibitors specifically. And one more little bit. I found this one really interesting. Well, the government was pussyfooting around trying to figure out how to address this epidemic, the gay community was helping itself and sending the message that you need to take care of each other, you need to be safe. Every queer event that you went to in the early 90s had condoms at it. Every single one of them. There was HIV information at every single one of them. As the Lazarus effect took on, as the protease inhibitors and the medications kicked in, the threat, the imminent threat of death was no longer a driver in this messaging and it fell off. And as it fell off, as you see, the numbers in the MSM community went up. Also look, the intravenous drug community started going way up and then it dropped back down and the heterosexual community has continued to increase. This is the concern and I'm going to talk mostly about MSM community because we're the wide, most widespread impacted across the United States. About 54% of all the cases in the U.S. are men who have sex with men. Now we talk about HIV and everybody's like, oh you're going to get HIV if you have sex with somebody who is HIV positive. Here are the facts. For one unprotected act, sexual act, here is the actual risk involved 
in getting the HIV virus. If somebody is on medication and has an undetectable viral load, which means that the measure of the free virus in their blood is zero, they are unlikely to pass the virus on at all. It's a chance of about one in 250,000 to about a million, depending on what sexual act. And yet, if you talk to people, the presumption is, is that if I have sex with somebody who's HIV positive, I'm going to get this virus really, really fast and really, really easy. It's an incredibly weak virus. If I were to cut myself and a drop of it were to, to land here, in about 15 seconds, the virus that was contained in the blood would be dead because it just doesn't live well in an oxygen-rich environment. Another little pretty thing. Um, these are where we're looking at positives versus people getting tested. This is actually, in some areas, particularly in Michigan, we know that there are more tests being done on people who are not necessarily at risk than there are people who are at risk, who need to get tested. A study that was done earlier this year, actually released in September of 2010, found that one in five gay and bi men in 21 US cities was infected with HIV. Of those, 44% did not know that they were infected with the virus. They thought they were negative. A person who does not know they're infected with the virus is more likely to have an increased viral load more likely to have a depressed immune system, and more likely to be infectious. We know, depending on which study you look at, between 70 and 90% of new cases of HIV are caused by people who do not know that they are infected with the virus. It is very rare that a person with HIV actually passes the virus on to another, who knows that they have the virus, passes the virus on to another person. This is also really important. Um, notice your age group. You are the fastest growing risk group. And you will continue to be. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and we're about to get into those. Wow, I'm actually missing a bunch of my slides. Never mind, we'll talk about them now. Um, we got into um, uh, this problem because of this lovely idea of abstinence-only education. Abstinence only came around in 1998, um, and the Clinton administration went, gosh golly, that's a great idea. And by 2004, it was the vast majority of funding that was available for comprehensive sex ed was actually this abstinence-only stuff, which wasn't working. Part of the problem with abstinence-only is on a federal policy level, abstinence-only is defined as abstinence is no sex outside of marriage. Well, if you're a gay or a bisexual man or a lesbian, you're not going to be able to get married in most states in the United States. So that message says you can't ever have sex. Well, that's an unrealistic message in and of itself. But secondly, we're not providing, when we do this abstinence-only messaging, we're not providing evidence and information to people to protect themselves when they do choose to have sex, whether it's before marriage or after marriage. And that's a real problem. And we're reaping what we sowed in the late 90s and through the 2000s. We are now seeing that age group, that 13 to 24 age group, who were the recipients of nothing but abstinence only, becoming the, the kindling for the epidemic again. And I think that's really important to remember. Um, the other thing that's sort of fueling this is in 2001, uh, social scientists came up with this fantastic idea that they called prevention for positives. Under the theory that as an HIV positive person, if I know how my, I, how my virus can be spread, I'm less likely to spread it if I know how to take uh, precautions and do risk reduction behavior. In theory, that's a great idea because it also said that they would test everybody so that people all knew their HIV status. The problem is that they didn't put any money into the testing. They put all the money into teaching HIV positive people how not to spread the virus. And in two years, the CDC will effectively stop funding all prevention programs except for prevention for positives. That's their own announcement from June of this year. 
And the reason for that is because it's easier to reach 1.2 million people who are living with the virus than it is to reach 200 or 300 million Americans who are not living with the virus. Again, there's no movement to increase testing. So if you don't know that you're HIV positive, and we know that the vast majority of new infections are caused by people who do not know that they're HIV positive, how is teaching me, as somebody who knows that I'm HIV positive, how to prevent the infection, going to stop Jimmy and Johnny who met on Manhunt last night and had unprotected sex from infecting each other? It's not. We have to get back to the basics, and the basics are what we developed in the 90s as a gay men's community, which was the message of keep yourself safe. Treat everybody as if they have HIV until proven otherwise. That means that we have an obligation, a responsibility, for every single time we have an event or a program that might even possibly hint at young people or LGBT people to have condoms available at everything. We need to be passing out condoms anywhere and everywhere we go. And Dee, I think, would probably agree with me on passing out condoms. Um, Dee and I met in the, the early 90s, actually. So, and you were involved in HIV education for years, so. So correct me if I'm wrong on any of this. Um, I know, we're wrapping on the dean for a while. So, um, so what we're seeing is all of these policy issues and this early 80s hysteria about this new disease are leading to people like me being punished for knowing my HIV status. Now, I'm lucky in that I'm real open about being HIV positive, but right now there are 445 people as of October. October 2011 in Ingham County with HIV and I believe there are maybe five to ten of them that are actually very out and open about it. I know lots of HIV positive gay men who don't disclose their HIV status on the dating sites. They don't talk about it. And there's this presumption going on that we call zero sorting where somebody who says that they're HIV negative will only have sex with somebody who says that they're HIV negative. Well, with those earlier statistics of one in five gay and bi men being infected with the virus, and 44% of those not knowing that, somebody could honestly say, I'm HIV negative, and actually be infected with the virus. So serosorting, in theory, should work, but unfortunately, in reality, until everybody is being tested, doesn't work. And what we're seeing is, because of that, there's also no information about how HIV is spread and how toxic or not toxic it is. So people operate off of that presumptive. And unfortunately, what we found is that in a study that was released by the Kaiser Family Foundation in uh, June, was that 60% of Americans get their information about HIV from the media, which is a frightening thought as somebody who works in the media. I'm telling you it's a terrifying thought. Um, <laughs> Because too often, the media is looking for a way to get your eyes on their story because that puts your eyes on the advertising, which drives their dollars and makes them money. So you don't get the information about the fact that Daniel Allen, the Macomb, Town, Macomb County gentleman who in 2009, sorry, it was 2010, I apologize, uh, was being gay bashed by three of his neighbors and bit one of them through the lip when it came out 10 days later that he was HIV positive, he was charged with bioterrorism. Right here in Michigan. The prosecutor argued that he used and possessed a harmful biological device, which was a 2003 law that was passed by the state legislature to address bioterrorism, which as you know, after 2001 was a huge concern. That was not bioterrorism. Yes, How was that information disclosed? How did they um, know? He was interviewed by a Fox 2 reporter, and the Fox 2 reporter told him that if he didn't tell the truth about his HIV status, that he was going to be charged with uh, perjury. And so the HIV positive guy, not knowing that a reporter couldn't say that or do that or have any ability to charge him, uh, told his HIV positive status. And why, did they, why would he have thought to have asked that? He was a very feminine gay man, a very feminine black gay man. So there's a lot of race issue that plays into this as well. In fact, the first case that I wrote about was the case of Michael Holder, who was convicted in Bay City in 2000. 
Michael had been dating a white woman and had disclosed his HIV status to her. He was arrested uh, after they broke up and charged with failure to disclose. Blatantly racist members on the jury, and I mean blatantly racist. One of the, the jurors was asked, all of them were asked, do you have a problem with interracial relationships? And one of the jurors actually said, I don't have a problem with it, but they shouldn't have children. <laughs> and the judge asked her, well, why not? And she said, well, because the children won't know what breed they are. <laughs> and she was allowed to sit on a jury hearing the case of a black man accused of failing to disclose his HIV positive status to a white woman. She got up, she testified, she said she wasn't told. She went home, they talked that night, and he said, I hope you understand what you've done, you've lied, you're gonna send me to prison, I hope you're happy. They talked on the phone. Of course, that was recorded because all jailhouse telephone calls are recorded. She went back the next morning to the prosecutor and said, I lied on the stand. I need to recant my testimony. To the prosecutor's credit, she did put this woman back up on the stage and she recanted her testimony. They rebutted it by playing this telephone recording, which was not a threat, which was not a challenge or anything like that, and the jury convicted him anyway. He spent eight years in the Michigan prison system for being HIV positive and failure, allegedly failing to disclose his status, even though his victim testified that he did. That's what these laws do. They give permission for us to act on our worst fears. Um, and, and I can go on and on about these cases. Um, Michael was painted as uh, an AIDS monster because he didn't disclose. Um, how many of you are aware of the young lady up in Canada who was 17 and a homeless woman who was having sex to, to live? And she was HIV positive and the cops found out and they released her photo and said, she's a threat. Anybody who's touched her needs to get in touch with us because she has HIV and she probably gave it to you. This just happened like two months ago. It's happening all the time. In Kalamazoo, they did it to a woman four years ago. They put her picture and, and her HIV positive status up on a poster and put it in every homeless shelter in Kalamazoo because they wanted to find victims. Well, why don't you address the real issues here, the fact that this is a woman that's homeless, that has no access to medical care, probably has not had proper counseling to address the fact that she has this virus, and probably is not getting proper medical care. Why don't you address those issues instead of trying to put her in jail, where all of us have to pay for it? Um, I'm fairly new to this issue. This sure. is really alarming, this, um, talking about this, but do people who um, champion these policies do they have an argument, or do they just consistently say things like AIDS is just um, a punishment against homosexual community? No, I mean, you, you, what you hear is you hear people saying, oh, it's about protecting people. Mm -hmm. It's about protecting people. Well, there, what we know from the studies is that these laws don't work. Mm -hmm. They don't actually change behavior. Mm -hmm. You know, an effective law changes behavior because you want you know, a social structure to it. So it becomes a false system and it's being used selectively to prosecute people. The problem is, is that law enforcement is very slow to move on anything dealing with stigma and HIV because they don't want to be seen as supporting the queers, they don't want to be seen as supporting prostitutes, they don't want to be seen as supporting those drug users, and all of those things can happen if you want to address HIV in sort of a rational process. Um, on the good news front, we are actually starting to see some movement on a federal level uh, Representative Barbara Lee from California earlier this year introduced the Repeal HIV Discrimination Act, which would actually use uh, federal monies, DOJ money, Department of Justice money, to basically bully states into repealing their HIV criminal statutes. Would say, you can't have this DOJ money until you don't have that law. Mm -hmm. um, which is exactly how they bullied us into passing those laws in the first place. So. It, it is starting, but I think we're probably looking at a decade before we're going to have a real conversation about it. Yes? Um, obviously, there's a lot of criminalization laws. Are there any privacy laws in terms of disclosing someone else's HIV status? Well, yes and no. Um, we found out here in Michigan that if, let's say, I driving home tonight, I'm pulled over and they see these sitting on the driver's seat. 
If the cop decides he wants to note that I have HIV medications in my car in the police report, that information can be released in the police report. That's not a violation of my privacy according to the Attorney General. And that's based on a case that happened in Lansing. Uh, police were conducting a sting operation targeting men who have sex with men in a local park, Fenner Arboretum. And uh, they only arrested two men, by the way. This supposedly horrible place where all this sex was happening and they could only find two men who, and both of them did expose themselves, supposedly. Um, one of them was HIV positive. And when the cop asked him, are you clean? He said, yes, I'm clean. And so they arranged to go and meet away from the park to have sex, and they arrested him. When they arrested him, they found his medications, and they kept saying, but you said you were clean. They said you were clean, and he said, I am clean. I took a shower today. Which he's right, he was. He took a shower, he's clean. Oh, you mean, do you have HIV? And we're finding more and more that because we're not being specific in our language when we're talking about sexual behavior, that we're not encouraging disclosure. So it's easy for me to say, yeah, I'm clean, I took a shower. Oh yeah, I'm also HIV positive. And just the, the very phrase of clean is in of itself stigmatizing. And it says that somehow I'm unclean, right? You know, which harkens back to sort of some biblical language and that sort of stuff. I'm sorry, I have a virus in my body. You have lots of viruses in your body. You have lots of bacteria in your body. In fact, you're probably more of a risk to me than I am to you when you get right down to it. So maybe you all are unclean and I'm clean. But we're not having those conversations. The other thing I, I wanted to go back on is some of these other policy issues, health threat to others. Uh, I just broke a story last week about a, uh, an investigation that was done by an M uh, University of Michigan student, I'm sorry, he's a U of M guy, mm -hmm. um, who is a women's study PhD candidate and has a master's in public health. He is looking at the application of Michigan's HIV disclosure laws and he discovered that at least two health jurisdictions, health department jurisdictions, are using the health threat to others statute for women who are HIV positive and get pregnant. So if you're a woman, you know you're HIV positive, you get pregnant, they're initiating a health threat to others charge against you. And HTTO means that they can do everything from order you to show up for counseling to locking you up for six months at a time. It's a really intrusive government intervention into your life. So regardless of what that woman has done to make that decision or how she got there, she has an HTTO initiated against her. Now the state is denying that this happens. Michigan, I love the Michigan Department of Community Health. They've done some phenomenal things, but they also really hate to admit it when they get it wrong. It takes them a while to admit that. The other thing that they found Back in 1997, Michigan went to a names reporting system. And uh, so if you test positive for HIV, your name gets logged into a database, which gets shared with the CDC, which, gosh, makes me feel real safe. Um, and we were told in 97, when this list was being created, that it would not be used for anything except to be reported to the CDC. That these names would never, ever be accessed for anything. Except that's not true anymore. What's happening is, is that if you test positive for a sexually transmitted infection, you're counseled for partner referrals, partner notification services. So let's say that um, you and I have sex and you get diagnosed two days later with chlamydia. And they're gonna ask you, well, who have you had sex with? And you say, well, I, there was Todd Haywood and there was you know, Joe Schmo, and they're gonna go and they're gonna put Joe Schmo's name into the database and check and see if Joe Schmo's there. And then they're going to put my name into it, and they're going to see if my name is there. And because my name is in the HIV database, they're going to initiate a health threat to others against me. That's happening in at least six local health department jurisdictions. The other thing that's happening is that a person who's HIV positive who tests positive for another sexually transmitted infection automatically has a health threat to others initiated against them. We, in fact, the, the researcher actually quoted one of the local health department officials saying that if somebody's HIV positive and has syphilis, that's de facto proof that they've had unprotected sex and are therefore a health threat to others. Except for the fact that syphilis can be spread by skin-to-skin -skin contact. 
So what it's really about is criminalizing the sexual behavior and intimate relationships of people living with this virus. And that's, as, as I showed, that's what the law is about as well. We are really going nuts on this. Instead of having real conversations about HIV and about personal responsibility, we're saying it's his fault, it's her fault. The, the cumulative responsibility buildup that we've created now is that I, as an HIV positive person, somehow have more responsibility in a sexual relationship for your safety than I do for my own. We've abdicated our own personal responsibility and liberty in terms of sexual responsibility for this, let the HIV positive people be responsible. And that's what these laws are really pushing, is making people like me be responsible for your sexual health. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to abdicate my sexual health to anybody. I certainly hope you don't want to abdicate your sexual health to somebody else either. And that's where we have to go back to that. We need to be giving out condoms to everybody. We need to be talking about safer sex. We need to be talking about safer behaviors. We need to talk about risk reduction. We also need to start talking about what does unprotected sex mean? of people saying barebacking is bad and that's the slang I, I guess the straight folks are starting to pick it up now too but it's slang for not using a condom well why are people having sex without a condom well obviously one of the reasons is because putting a condom on in the middle of sex is a pain in the ass but one of the other issues is just that for a lot of people there is a level of intimacy that's involved in that and until we address those very real issues we're never going to address the problems underneath it. And that's where you know these abstinence programs and the, the HTTO program and the disclosure law and prevention for positives are preventing us from having very real dialogues.